I teach uh, liturgical studies at Huron University College, which is a college of the University of Western Ontario. Eastern Canada still has uh, almost an English arrangement in that uh, the university, which is about 35,000 students, is actually made up of colleges. Uh, Huron, it's a public university. Huron is an Anglican college and is actually the founding college of the whole university. Uh, there are three Roman Catholic institutions also, and the rest are colleges by their field, not by their religious foundation. It, the colleges are small. It's intended to give students both um, the intimacy of a tutorial and um, everything that a big university offers. So we have about 1,100 students. Embedded within that is what we call the Faculty of Theology, and the Faculty of Theology offers an MA, uh, an MDiv, so there's a seminary embedded in it, um, a Bachelor's of Theology, and what the Canadians, uh, Anglicans call a licentiate, which is actually a non-credit or continue, continuing ed program for lay people in parishes or uh, for the permanent diaconate. So I do that. I'm also the liturgical officer for the diocese uh, where I'm living right now. Uh, we have a new bishop, Linda Nichols, who is absolutely wonderful, and she's a joy to work with. Um, so that, and then I also do some work for the National Church of Canada, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, in the second presentation today. I'm um, uh, born in California, which is how I know a number of people here, uh, and uh, spent time in the uh, diocese of. Uh, ordained for the Diocese of Los Angeles originally and spent time in the Diocese of California, which as you know is not the whole state of California. Um, I think that's sufficient to the day. My PhD is in liturgical studies. I have a double degree, double PhD, in liturgical history and sacramental theology uh, from the Graduate Theological Union, um, uh, MA in liturgical studies from St. John's Collegeville, Minnesota, and two degrees in music uh, before that because I thought I was going to do music and then changed my mind. So my first assignment was to talk about the member churches of the Anglican Communion and some of the liturgical renewal. What you have in front of you is an outline and, and if you've glanced at it you can see it's quite uneven. Um, I'm, I'm not doing every member church of the Anglican Communion. Um, some of them I'm spending a fair amount of time on, others uh, just uh, a little bit of brief information. And I should say a little bit about why in the world um, I know anything about this. I'm the um, just immediate past president of Societas Liturgica, which is the International Ecumenical Liturgy Gathering. Um, I'm actually still on the board because of some problems that arose the past couple of years. But I'm also the chair of IELC, International Anglican Liturgical Conference. Um, we just have a brand new web page up. Uh, it's been a lot of work sort of getting IELC um, into the 21st century, and I think we're very, very close. But in that capacity, I uh, have been uh, engaged in some conversations around the Anglican Communion. I suspect looking at the esteemed gathering here that many of you know a lot of this already, and I know your chair, Devin, and many of you are also doing the survey, the questions for which I, I saw. And I just have to say thank you for the process that you're doing. I, I think, you know, looking at what other member churches of the Anglican Communion um, have been doing, their experiences, what went well, what did not go well, what they might suggest to you is really an essential um, process. So thank you. So I'm going to start um, with the Asian Anglican Liturgical Group, and that is the name they have given to themselves. This is a group that has been forming over the past eight months. It is co-sponsored by ILC, uh, but it is also regional. Um, we gathered twice, sort of a sequential uh, conference, last November, first in Seoul and then in Hong Kong. I'll, I'll put the details are under the Hong Kong conference because that was longer and more of an intense conversation. So first in Seoul, uh, we met under the auspices, and that means um, also financially supported by, uh, the Cathedral of St. Mary the Virgin and St. Nicholas, which is the, cathed the Anglican Cathedral in Seoul as part of its 125th anniversary. 
Um, there were three primary uh, presentations. What makes a liturgy Anglican by the Reverend Dr. John Cater, uh, who is retired, I think, several times now from CDSP <laughs> and the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, but John also teaches every year for at least half the year at Mingwa uh, Seminary in Hong Kong. There was a response by Tomas Mandela of St. Andrew's Theological Seminary in Manila. Um, I talked about the future of baptism, ecclesiology, and eschatology, and there was a response by Shintaro Ichihara um, of the Japanese Anglican Church, and then an overview of Korean, Japanese, and Filipino liturgical renewal. It was an extraordinary gathering. Uh, I was amazed at the numbers of Anglican religious the cathedral is in a compound. It's right in the heart of Seoul. And if you remember uh, the political news last November, uh, there were massive protests against the, the president who has now resigned. And that happens right on the doorstep of the cathedral. Uh, but it is a, a compound with the British Embassy on one side and fronts on that main street. And within the compound is a substantial convent and we stayed at the convent. Um, so it was really interesting. It was a gathering primarily of religious and uh, clergy uh, in the Korean Anglican Church uh, for several really lovely conversations that continued after the three presentations that I've listed here. Um, the Hong Kong Conference, which we move to next, uh, was hosted by the several dioceses of Hong Kong particularly the Diocese of West Kowloon, and uh, by Minghua Seminary. So it was a joint sponsorship. And there, um, I'm going to just give an overview of some of the things that are going on in each of the churches that see themselves as part of the Asian Anglican liturgical group. So first, the Hong Kong province. Uh, the liturgical work uh, is being produced in booklet form. Uh, which is an interim step for them towards a new prayer book, which they are hoping will uh, be come out in 2019. And there's a number of seasonal things they had. They were particularly uh, quite excited about their work on uh, new Advent liturgical resources. Uh, and I think there's some cultural reasons for that. In other words, there's sort of a pushback against it's all Christmas all the time from the end of September. So they were quite excited about that. Um, they've developed a marriage rite, and again, this is in the booklet form, which for them is trial use, for a mixed marriage, meaning uh, between a Christian and a non-Christian, which has not been officially observed. They are expanding, and they spend some time talking about the expansion of the funeral service to include rites and actual texts for children. Uh, for the first time for them, for deaths through suicide and finding... Uh, resources there in the Roman Catholic Order of Christian Funerals, which in its fifth section has specific prayers for funerals for those who die by suicide. And for non-Christian catechumens, um, uh, there was, yes, there was a debate, uh, aren't catechumens Christian? Um, but it's, it's, very, it's, it's very interesting um, that there are large numbers of catechumens because if someone has converted to Christianity, it is not acceptable in their culture, if their parents are still alive, that they do that kind of rejection. So we ha there's a lot of adults who uh, will wait to be baptized until uh, their parents uh, have died. Um, the ordination service has uh, not so much an overall change, but a shift in elements to be inclusive of family and friends. And they talked for quite a while about the sort of clerical club that happens at ordination liturgies and finally questions directed toward the whole congregation, the invitation for family and friends uh, to be part of the vesting and part of the other um, individual ritual moments, which for them again is, is new. And a series of new Eucharistic prayers, which are being written, not just prefaces, not just seasonal prefaces, but actual Eucharistic prayers, including what I think was really interesting, the hope of including an early Syriac Eucharistic prayer, which will link Chinese Anglicanism to the earliest Christian presence in China. So really seeing for them uh, their deep roots, which are not solely uh, Western and uh, from colonial missionary era. 
Hong Kong, of course, is also at the University of Hong Kong, is also the um, art museum, which is quite small, but it's where all the Nestorian crosses and other statues, remnants of that, are kept. And so that history, visually, is right there in Hong Kong for them. Revisions to the sanctuary cycle, which seems to be going on all over the uh, Anglican Communion, to include more local saints. And I'm trying to imagine a cycle based not on uh, the birthday into eternal life, uh, the death date, uh, but somehow uh, attentive to the lunar cycle by which people live their lives in the larger cultures of Hong Kong. So that'll be interesting. There's work on a hymnal uh, with theological texts more in line with Anglicanism. And uh, that was sort of left hanging, and I thought, I'm clearly missing something. Uh, so when I asked, uh, a lot of the new music in Hong Kong is really coming out of evangelical and Pentecostal churches, and they were concerned about some of the theology expressed in those musical texts. So responding to that. Um, and the initiation rites uh, have been, uh, the work on it thus far, uh, is primarily um, influenced by the 1991 ILC gathering in Toronto about patterns of initiation. The um, catechesis for training and cultural recognition of Anglican identity was a really interesting conversation and I'll probably mention it more than once because it comes up more than once. But there's a, a type of uh, double enculturation, and I'll come back to this, an enculturation into the contemporary cultures and a re-enculturation into Anglican identity. I'll say more about that uh, towards the end. And I, I mentioned Chen Wai Lam um, because of his um, organization uh, Chen Wai teaches liturgy at Minghua. He was actually one of my students in, in Berkeley um, and really did a wonderful job of organizing the information and the group that was representing the province and the diocese of Hong Kong. Second, the Anglican Church of Korea, um, which produced a prayer book, a new prayer book in 2004, is in the process of being corrected. <laughs> uh, this is another theme I heard more than once. In other words, it was done so quickly that it is, uh, in, in, from their perspective, riddled with typos and errors, a lot of editorial errors, which actually impact how it is used in some places. So that's a primary focus, as well as expansions to the current text. And they have decided, rather than the supplemental approach to the prayer book, that they would like to actually produce a new prayer book in 2020. The issue here of enculturation uh, comes up again. And it's, uh, as I mentioned already, this sort of double in, uh, in, uh, enculturation. But it's particularly pronounced in the Korean presentation. So Korean Anglicans, in reflecting on their own tradition, this is a quote uh, from Nakhon Ju, who said, the issue of enculturation is tricky. Korea is a very westernized culture. Much of the past cultural heritage is not the focus or the desire to raise up in the liturgy. And much of the past is also a colonial and politically charged past. So in other words, when people say, why aren't you doing more to enculturate the liturgy? Their response is to what culture and to what past is it to be enculturated? So here's that double enculturation, local cultures and another to shape and retain Anglican identity. So both Hong Kong and Korea are saying similar things. Another issue, and this comes, I'll talk a, a little bit more about this at the end, uh, related to enculturation, is the localization of globalization. Um, I'll come back to that. Of these many histories for Korean Anglicanism, what provides the tradition? And I think that's what the Chinese of Hong Kong are asking and um, looking at in that Syriac Eucharistic prayer. Um, when did Anglicanism start for us? When uh, English missionaries came or when Christianity came to China? Uh, so which, which is the history? Korean Anglicans also continuing work on Eucharistic prayers, uh, expanding prefaces seasonally, writing new prayers, 
And uh, voicing what a couple other groups said is the hope for a common Asian Eucharistic prayer. When I asked what that might look like, uh, it was a little unclear, but uh, it's interesting that they're thinking across um, a number of provinces. Proper colics and other resources for particular days of commemoration. And here, uh, this goes hand in hand with the expansion of the sanctuary cycle to include local saints. For Korea, as with other Asian communities, the need to address the reality of cremation and the common cultural practice, and underlying that sort of to remove the ecclesial message that a cremation is a second-class Christian funeral as opposed to a burial. Uh, if you, Seoul is a city of 10 million. Uh, if you've been to Hong Kong, you know it's a vertical city. Uh, there's not room to bury people, uh, nor is that the, the broader cultural practice. Uh, but there's been almost a stigma against it within Christian circles. It's interesting, in Seoul, uh, the cathedral, which has, I think, four floors underground, uh, one of them is a beautiful new columbarium, uh, which seems to be really an important catechetical uh, um, event. Uh, and it's uh, a lot of the newer uh, columbaria, uh, you have a glass front slot, and uh, it is not locked. It's not bolted shut. It's not permanent. So people were constantly going down there and adding flowers within the box in which the urn sat. So cards and engagements and, uh, you know, just some really touching things going on um, of exchange with that. Rather than what I've seen in North America more is where once that urn's in there, you never see it again. You never engage with it. So I think uh, what I saw in Seoul w was really, really effective. Um, the message of civic and church at the death of a Christian must involve, according to them, a way to acknowledge and work with the common placement of funeral homes in the hospitals where people die. So the funeral home is in the hospital, and the crematoria are city-owned. So how does the church engage in that? They were particularly fascinated with um, the order of Christian funerals, which is becoming a fairly standard ecumenical pattern with its emphasis on processions, how does the stational nature of uh, funerals change when everything's in one building and it's uh, primarily state-owned? The arrival of a 2015 hymnal, so this is Korea, uh, a step ahead of uh, the Hong Kong church, has broadened ecumenical and cultural resources for congregational liturgical music, and they were um, quite excited to have that uh, ecumenical breadth. And the Koreans in particular were very proud of their new prayer app <laughs> and its impact on shaping daily prayer in the calendar. They said this means the church is always with each Christian. <laughs> and, um, and for a really high-tech, media-savvy uh, world like Korea, um, uh, that uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, people are walking around praying morning prayer with their with their with their app. Um, so, uh, particularly thanks to Na Kunju, uh, who also studied in Berkeley, California, and is the sub dean at the cathedral and uh, uh, works a great deal with liturgy. The Episcopal Church in the Philippines uh, produced a 2001 prayer book, and the current work has been both corrections to the prayer book, so here we go, another one that was written uh, perhaps a little too quickly, um, as well as reconstituting their liturgy committee. Um, compared to the energy of the Hong Kong committee and engaged members and the Korean uh, group, um, the Philippines has struggled uh, financially, uh, in gathering people together. Uh, I'm sure there are some other issues that I did not understand that were sort of a subtext, uh, but it was clear that they uh, were struggling to reform uh, this liturgy committee. Their primary concerns that they shared with us was the need for simpler pew editions of books. They said very few parishes have any books to put in the hands of lay people. Uh, part of this is financial, part of this is literacy, part of this is a gazillion different languages. 
There's a need for hymnals and music books that can be developed in spite of copyright and other restrictions. In other words, how do we develop music resources in very simple versions that can be put into the hands of lay people where we're not bumping into the expenses of copyright and other restrictions? So we, we talked about uh, raising up local composers. Uh, and it, it, again, uh, linguistics is part of the issue. Um, but they uh, had set up sort of a subcommittee, I think of one person who was going to explore um, probably a, 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 a cultures which are really musically engaged, but seems to stop at the door of the church, sadly enough. The hope was for shared music resources among different Anglican churches as well as between churches in the Philippines. So maybe as uh, these different, uh, if they're not in uh, Korean and not in Chinese, perhaps those uh, issues could be shared. The enculturation issues, of course, uh, for liturgical reform uh, is really a question of what is Filipino cultural identity. Again, there's so many different cultures and languages. It's interesting, there were just three representatives at this gathering in November from the Philippines, and each of them spoke a different language. Uh, so on the bus, um, there, there were, uh, uh, on the phone, there were three different languages going on. So what happens then is that the common language becomes English for many um, uh, uh, Filipinos. Uh, but of course, that carries lots of baggage. So there's, there's cultural issues with that. The multiple languages of worship, of course, puts uh, pressure on uh, liturgical renewal as first and foremost being the work of translation. Uh, so one of the things that they're exploring is a proposal to suggest an outline or basic structure of the essential, or if you prefer, immutable elements of liturgy, with a secondary list of suggestions for the elements that should change from place to place. Of course, this is, this is not new to many of us, but in their thinking it was new. Um, I sort of reminded them of the Anglican document, Down to Earth Worship, which already had that, that double approach uh, and its... Um, clear um, roots in uh, Sacra Sanctum Concilium of Vatican II, uh, the elements which mis must change and those which do not change. How do, you, how do you decide that? What goes in the first column? What goes in the second column? And how does that change in each of the cultural uh, groups in the Philippines? One aspect of the both and uh, part of enculturation is again to develop the sanctral cycle to include both local saints for each area as well as expand the universal sanctral, understanding uh, uh, Phil uh, Philippines wide sanctral as something that would bind together these different groups. Funeral rites, again, and I don't think this is a coincidence that a lot of uh, um, Anglican member churches are dealing with funerals because it's that meeting point of, of culture and church, uh, and a lot of them had not been updated in quite a while. Funeral rites were receiving particular attention from the scattered um, uh, committee members, some of them, uh, two of them quite rural, because of culture and language. But it was interesting, the primary concern was adapting the funeral rites because of climate and geography. The roads often wash out, so bodies cannot be moved to the centralized cemeteries. In other words, the coffin can only go as far as they can be carried. So all sorts of other arrangements need to be made for local cemeteries and authorization for lay-led burials. Particular thanks to Tomas Mandela, who um, uh, led that group. The Anglican Church of Japan, Nippon Saikokai, has a new prayer book as of 2014, but is already at work on the next prayer book. Uh, this is a very small church, uh, particularly in, uh, compared to the uh, Korean church and, and especially the Hong Kong church. But it's been very organized and active in the preparations moving toward a new prayer book. Uh, the groundwork for that has included a careful and challenging look at the complications to liturgical reform brought about by the four different sources of missionary activity. Uh, and what they meant by that was um, the different churchmanship, for lack of another word, that was carried with those different missionary groups that then continues to affect current theological and liturgical conversations in the uh, revision that's underway now. One of the ongoing issues uh, related to the founding of Anglican churches in Japan and the, this, this sort of multiple groundwork is extended communion. 
So with different theologies, the attempts to regularize reserved sacramental practices have been difficult. Uh, we've got, still have Japanese Anglican churches which do not have the reserved sacrament and others that have always had it. But it becomes an issue now when there is a growing need for lay-led and diaconally-led liturgies to have the reserved sacrament. So two different, uh, different traditions and uh, a new pastoral reality are sort of bumping into each other. So ongoing explorations about extended communion. The first sort of finished or uh, final draft work for this new prayer book has actually dealt with biblical translations and lectionary issues which are completely connected, even though they might not always be in our mind, because the different translations have different versification, which affects the lectionary pericopes. So the, the biblical translation and lectionary issues go hand in hand, and they've done a great deal of work on that. Effective in June 2016, the order of the rites of initiation were changed, with First Communion coming before Confirmation. There's been a tremendous amount of work uh, gone into catechesis for First Communion, which is now to be used in all parishes. And I'm very sorry in the sort of rushing around, uh, it was just yesterday, rushing around yesterday, I did not bring the resource with me because uh, it's there's beautiful booklets for both parents and children uh, that they have clearly put a lot of energy, a lot of money, and a lot of love into. Particular liturgies for specific events, such as the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, are also an ongoing concern. Uh, I just received an email yesterday that uh, John Cato is uh, stepping down as the bishop, and it's been his diocese in, in which all of this has happened. Uh, but sort of just keeping up with the basics means uh, that they, when they, when they have these disasters, unfortunately, there's been a series of them in Japan. Uh, they don't have the, the alternative text. They don't have that set up. So that's what they're hoping for, both ones that are specific and ones that can uh, be more general for urgent situations. They're doing an updated marriage rite. Uh, that's particularly for them, uh, contemporary Japanese language and the imagery which I think had to do uh, uh, from their conversation with a great deal of uh, gender equality um, uh, rather than uh, some more traditional Japanese views of women. The secretary of the prayer book revision uh, group concluded by saying there were six particular foci that is really guiding prayer book revision. First, to take into consideration the five marks of mission. Second, to expand lay-led liturgies, sorry, uh, third, to develop a more coherent initiation theology. Fourth, to respond to contemporary issues. Fifth, to recognize the ecumenical reality where Christians are a small minority. And this is particularly cooperation between Roman Catholic, Lutheran, and Anglican. And lastly, to take into consideration the Asian perspective and some hope for the common Asian Anglican prayers. And with thanks to Shintaro Ichihara, who is that secretary. In addition to those presentations, uh, there were there was talk about those who were not at the table, uh, the church in Southeast Asia, and they're hoping in the next gathering that more will be included. Uh, I had a phone conversation with the steering committee of IELC around the world last week too, and it came up in that conversation. Um, this includes um, uh, Singapore, West Malaysia, dependent deaneries, and it was interesting to hear a little bit about what was going on there, too. Singapore includes the deanery of Nepal, and they had uh, really large numbers of baptisms and confirmations in December, January, and February of just the past three months. Uh, Thailand has seen a number of new church plants. And both movements said they were really in need of accurately translated liturgical materials because somebody's doing it in their living room um, on their computer. And also culturally sensitive materials was their second emphasis. So we hope the next time the Asian Anglican liturgy group gathers that these other voices will be heard.
Devin, what time would you like me to go to? Uh, no. Keep going? Yes. Okay, good. I, I can do that. Just yeah. throw something this way. Okay. All right. Uh, moving to um, a different part of the world, the Anglican Church, New Zealand, Polynesia. Um, again, uh, probably a lot of this is uh, known. Uh, the prayer book, which is famous, uh, in 1989, a lot, of, a lot of work went into preparing the final updates on liturgical renewal for New Zealand in time for the 2009 hosting of ILC in Auckland. They were sort of rushing to get things ready for that meeting. Um, and then there was a, 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 another sort of round or flurry of work post-2012. Uh, um, none of these are actually at the moment intended to be parts of a new prayer book, but rather supplemental to the existing prayer book. Um, there's an updated uh, revised common lectionary along with collects, which is actually numbered. Uh, pa the pagination are supplemental pages that are stuck into the existing prayer book, so they actually have those page numbers. There's rewriting of collects to have consistent endings. Uh, uh, which member of the Trinity are we praying to? And therefore, who, who ends up at the end? Uh, <laughs> it's another one of those very quick things that maybe needed to go back to. Um, those were partially published in 2000 and continue. Uh, working on a common certificate of baptism, which is really interesting. That would be uh, uh, this person was baptized in the name of the Trinity and in water and will be uh, same form between Roman Catholic and Anglicans. A new 2012 resource for them, new, uh, for the Easter cycle titled From Ashes to Fire. And the uh, CLLC, the Common Life Liturgical Commission, uh, from 2014 to, uh, 2014 to 2016, uh, works on this ongoing uh, proper collect project, translating Eucharistic liturgies into Hindi, Fiji, Fiji, Fijian, Tongan, and Samoan, developing a complete prayer book online, and apparently it's more than half done now, the revision of initiation rites with an adoption of the U.S. theological statement about baptism. Holy baptism is full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit, which means then they had to do something with confirmation. So they say a setting aside of confirmation. What is added is a liturgy for the laying on of hands for affirmation, renewal, and reception, which is in their words, not confirmation, is pastoral, is repeatable, could be either a return or a welcome, is not a rite of education, is hand laying an optional anointing, and is an Episcopal rite. Also the development of proper prayers, rites, and resources for the 2014 bicentenary, um, also of ANZAC and World War I observations, uh, particularly last year. And uh, the focus uh, on returning to authorized services, setting aside experimental liturgies. It's interesting. That could mean one of two things, <laughs> depending on who you're talking to, doesn't indeed mean a couple of things. It could mean that what was once experimental is now official, so we don't need that. Uh, but it also seems to me a tightening of what is allowed. Optional forms of liturgies of the word and blessings for those entering into civil marriage. So a civil marriage celebrated and then uh, followed by a church blessing. This is New Zealand and Polynesia. The Anglican Church of Australia, since the publication of the 1995 prayer book, liturgical renewal has continued by expanding the repertoire of liturgies and options as additions to the prayer book. Again, not so much a new prayer book, but additions. Um, the Liturgy Commission, which was reordered in 2001, so it's been underway for 16 years now. Uh, liturgical resources for Lent, Holy Week, and Easter, particularly the Triduum, uh, for baptism, including alternative baptismal services. Uh, how does a baptismal service sound different, feel different, look different, be different in morning and evening prayer? Liturgical resources for Holy Communion, particularly uh, with children. Uh, resources for a second order for particular occasions, Eucharistic prayers for particular occasions. So again, not just a, a variable preface, but the prayer with a particular focus. Um, a set of uh, Holy Communion third order where the themes are drawn from the prophet Joel. Uh, a lot of liturgical resources with environmental themes, including lament for drought, deforestation, flood, resources around the theme of food, which 
really comes under that title. Resources around the theme of stewardship of creation. Again, quite extensive, some general, some specific. Occasional prayers that were not uh, there prior to this. Parish events, reconciliation election, uh, national elections, they mean, or local elections. Caregivers, missionaries, aboriginal Christians. Prayer for an end to violence against women. Several things in that category. And liturgical resources for various pastoral situations. Blessing of a civil marriage, but actually a, an extensive section on prayers after sexual abuse. Liturgical resources for the Anzac uh, centenary, as I mentioned, pattern of scripture readings, uh, office and Eucharistic lectionaries, and the differences between the lectionaries, the older Australian, the newer Australian, guidelines for clergy and musicians. And uh, this is related to one of the bullet points above, the emergence of advice on private confessions related to child sexual abuse. Um, uh, there's a number of cases which have come to light uh, in the last decade, really. And now for something completely different, Europe. Um, now, um, I know including a category of European Anglicans technically makes no sense because there is no such thing, right? There are parishes and communities of the diocese in Europe, which is Church of England, and parish and, uh, parishes and communities of the Convocation of Episcopal Churches in Europe, which is the U.S. Um, but I've included them here because I think there's some very interesting things happening. Uh, the communities are often composed of a distinctly minority group. In other words, their flavor of Christianity is not the majority. And that results in some interesting qualities. Particularly in the Diocese of Europe parishes, the identity as Anglicans is clearer than U.S. and certainly in Canada. Uh, I, again and again, and I've spent time running through a number of these different communities in the past couple years, we are not Roman Catholics, we are not Protestants, we are Anglicans. And um, that's something I, I don't hear much in Canada. Uh, maybe you hear it more here. Ecumenism is an essential in European Anglican circles. And it is an ecumenism in many places, is specifically linked to both the differences and the similarities with Roman Catholicism, or in some other geographical centers with old Catholics. The worshiping communities are multicultural, multilingual, and multidenominational. So it may seem like these pieces don't fit together, but oddly enough, they do. So the identity on the ground is almost a post-denominationalism which is part of the expression of we are not Roman Catholics, we are not Protestants, we are Anglicans. This is what Anglicans are. Um, the interest in Anglican liturgy has risen immensely uh, since the Anglican Evensong in St. Peter's this month. It's made a huge effect, as well as the other Evensong that didn't get advertised in North America, and that was in the Duomo in Florence. So for the first time in history that we know of, um, Anglican Evensong was sung by the choir of Merton College, Oxford, at St. Peter's in the Vatican, and the same thing in Florence. Um, the presence of official prayer books for the Episcopal churches, uh, in particular, uh, and their translations, their very fluid translations, and I think here of the Italian, uh, this, the Spain, Spanish, French, and German, as well as the unofficial, uh, Dutch and others, really kind of changes the liturgical boundaries. So it brings us back to the multicultural, multilingual, multidenominational as one of the ways that people say we're Anglican. Um, one of the things I, w I was uh, uh, interesting, just uh, an example, uh, last month I was at um, the parish of St. Mary and St. Martha in Leuven in Belgium. And uh, meets in a Roman Catholic parish, and uh, there's a, a tree carving uh, right next to where we sit. And the tree has slots um, carved into it, and each slot holds a Bible in a different translation. So depending on who's there, the first reading, you can take, if you're the lector, and you're just sort of pointed out when you walk in, you find the Bible that is your language. Carry it up and read from there. I thought this is really interesting. One of the things that uh, I'm doing this summer coming in, in, in Leuven for ILC uh, is to acknowledge that Anglicans in Europe are among, uh, live in the midst of the worst refugee crisis ever known. 
uh, as well as uh, untold opportunities for Muslim and Christian interfaith prayers. It's going to be uh, one part of our gathering in Leuven for IELC is to, is to learn from European Anglicans uh, what the rituals are, what the liturgies are, and what they're doing. So we just uh, have been gathering that material, uh, just be, have begun this past month. England. Sometimes it's good to go back a ways, um, especially in a very long process that's been meticulously documented when it comes to liturgical renewal in England. Uh, you know, really, this goes back to the 1928 English prayer book. Well, you could go back to the Oxford to Cambridge movements. You could just keep going back uh, at the English adoption of the continental liturgical movement in projects all the way back to the parish communion movement beginning of the 20th century. There's just been uh, an almost unbroken evolution. Uh, that have led to, uh, through experimental or temporary resource books, and have led to the services and resources that comprise common worship. Um, and now I'm quoting from um, their own documents, represent the latest stage of a process of liturgical revision. They were originally drafted by the liturgical commission. The material is passed on to the House of Bishops, which amends the material, so they're presented to the General Synod. And, and you know this, but I found it really helpful to go back and read it again. Forms of services that were alternative to equivalence in the Book of Common Prayer were debated by Synod and revised by Synodical Revision Committee in the light of comments made by Synod members and the wider public. The House of Bishops then reconsidered them, put them into their final form, and submitted them to the General Synod for final approval as authorized services. Um, but additional material, so alternative and additional are two different categories. Additional material, which had no equivalent in the Book of Common Prayer, was debated by the General Synod and then put in its final form and commended by the House of Bishops. You notice how one is a much more complex process than the other. The 16 volumes that comprise common worship, what they call a family of liturgical books and its ancillary publications, continue. The current experimental volume, if you will, 2015, is on accessible baptismal texts. And one of the questions um, uh, that uh, Chris Irvine of uh, Canterbury Cathedral asked, asked last week is, how do we talk about how is the complexity of mystery and the evocative and symbolic language of liturgy and scripture, how does that become accessible? And just one example there, the introduction to the sacrament of baptism in this 2015 volume. Our Lord Jesus Christ has told us that to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must be born again of water and the spirit and has given us baptism as the sign and seal of this new birth. Here we are washed by the Holy Spirit and made clean. Here we are clothed with Christ, dying to sin that we may live his risen life. As children of God, we have a new dignity and God calls us to fullness of life. Um, is that accessible? It doesn't seem dumbing down. But that is the debate that's going on in a number of circles right now, as well with well, a few other debates occupying the Church of England uh, in liturgical theology and liturgical practice. Another issue um, that I'm very conscious of it, because of uh, working in Canada at the moment is the double strand of liturgical books. In other words, the very different expressions of theology between the 1662 prayer book uh, in its particularity and common worship which of course is a product of the ecumenical liturgical movement, would seem to propose a ritually divided church. And so this is me asking them rather than them volunteering. So is it, uh, does this propose a ritually divided church? Um, what was interesting was one of the uh, things that they highlighted was the daily office is often in both forms in parishes and cathedrals in particular. And in many cathedrals, morning prayer is used through common prayer and even song, of course, 1662 BCP. So there's a whole generation now primarily shaped by common worship. But in spite of that, and perhaps because of the centrality of cathedrals and because they're an awful lot closer together than cathedrals are in North America, along with, as you, I'm sure you are aware, their startling increase in numbers of attendance and baptisms at cathedrals, um, the, the sort of very presence of the BCP and common worship really keeps both present and practiced better than in other member churches of the communion. So the crucial role that cathedrals are playing in holding together two different liturgical and sometimes theological uh, presentations. 
The Church of Ireland, uh, new prayer book in 20, 2004, um, it, it was meant to, in their own words, both preserve services of the church handed down through the centuries and create alternative contemporary language services. Since then, of course, it's been updated in online versions of several services that have been the focus of liturgical renewal, uh, uh, supplementing that 2004 prayer book. Um, and a number of translations from English to Gaelic um, that is the word that they use, Gaelic, not Celtic. The primary uh, foci. The two marriage services, traditional and contemporary languages, received several changes in, in 2009. A hymnal supplement was approved in 2015. A compendium of different expressions of worship was gathered together in 2015. And what this means is really everything from messy church to new monasticism. So it's quite a broad collection. Uh, proper prayers and resources uh, developed for the centenary observances of World War One and the uh, Easter, I put uprising, but it's actually Easter rising in their language of 1916. A Eucharistic prayer developed for gatherings primarily composed of children, uh, schools in mind here. And, and here we go, in common with their Korean neighbors, an easy app for accessing daily prayer is in the works. Uh, and all of these, again, are supplements and translations, not... Uh, at least outwardly expressed as the bones of a new prayer book. In the Church in Wales, it's a two-volume book of common prayer, one in English, one volume in English, one in Welsh, 1984. All sorts of supplements continue. Uh, for example, an order for Christian funerals, which picks up the ecumenical turn or return to the three primary funeral liturgies, an alter alternative ordinal order. Uh, revised marriage rites that contain additional texts in 2013. And it's interesting that here they went back to their own traditional Welsh prayers and started to include those. Uh, so there is a, a sort of fundamental enculturation going on there. Bilingual booklets produced for seasons. And this was done by ordinance. Gosh, I wish I'd thought of that. Um, so that's bad. they're getting credit for this. An interesting 2015 collection of prayers for a child, which is everything for... Uh, prayers uh, of thanksgiving for adoption, uh, prayers for children being sent off to school, all, just all sorts of different categories uh, within uh, a co the same collection. And of course, background theological work continuing on same-sex partnerships, as well as um, what's probably a, quite an issue for the church in Wales of confirmation as admission to communion. In the Church of the Province of Southern Africa, which I know, uh, I think uh, Devon's had a chance to talk to Keith Griffiths, who I'm quoting here, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. You can you can read this yourself. Um, they're moving towards, um, uh, begun in 2014, a prayer book for Southern Africa today, which is what they're calling their new work. But I was really, going back to the 1989 prayer book, I was really touched by what I had forgotten, is one of the most thoughtful general prefaces I've read. Developed at the same time as political and humanitarian crises in their country, the committee asked if liturgical revision was an offensive luxury at such a time as this. The answer is an emphatic no, because the church's worship of God in prayer and sacrament is a priority in every circumstance, and very particularly in times of crisis and change. Isn't that amazing? I mean, to think what they have gone through um, and and to, to put that out there, uh, very um, uh, thoughtful. Uh, Bruce Jenniker is now heading um, uh, the liturgical renewal of consultation. Um, Keith Griffiths has been part of it for a very long time. One of the things that I had a conversation with about Keith Griffiths, I said, what would you think would be the most important thing last week? Uh, he's quite uh, taken again with the sanctoral cycle and the the uh, tension, the healthy tension between universality and local theology and issues. He said we we work with ten different nations, um, and what saints are shared that bind the province together, but how how also are local and often immediately connected saints connected to people both presented, and uh, it's it was we had a very interesting conversation about this living example of what's known as tribal versus Catholic, which was uh, very much in the air of liturgical scholarship. Uh, I think of Catherine Lacuna's article of, of uh, uh, almost two decades ago now, 
of, of the constant tension between tribal and Catholic or local and universal. Um, also, the same thing with uh, a recent publication on Easter, uh, which of course has to come out in multiple languages and then changes the uh, some of the nuances of theology because uh, they're not literal translations, they're dynamic equivalents. Uh, but it's uh, primarily a common teaching on the great 50 days. The Church of the Province of West Africa may surprise you. Um, why, why in the world I included it there? Um, it's interesting. The province is uh, 17 dioceses uh, in eight countries. The province is mixed in its relationships with GAFCON, as much of Africa is. Some of the dioceses ordain women. Some remain adamantly in communion with the U.S. Episcopal Church, uh, Liberia in, in case. Um, Cameroon, bilingual, centered in Douala with outstations in Bafazam. Uh, one issue, interesting in, in the Cameroon uh, gathering, was uh, the church uh, declaring that it was at war, it will fight against Boko Haram, and not allow anyone to use the church to hide to join groups which are terrorizing others. Uh, I include it for two reasons. I'm on my way to Cameroon um, in 10 days. Uh, my daughter's in the Peace Corps in Cameroon, uh, along with all the Peace Corps uh, kids. They are increasingly being pulled south for their own protection as Boko Haram sweeps from Nigeria across uh, northern Cameroon. Um, but I think it's a really important reminder um, that some of the things we deal with in North America are so different. Uh, that the Anglican Church, with all, a lot of divisions right now, it's been in the news recently, um, an impoverished church without resources, borrowing a few helpful texts and translating, uh, knowing being Christian is a matter of life or death, and seeing its own church used as, as a hiding place uh, for terrorists. And, you know, we say, oh, well, that's such harsh language. Um, to come out, uh, we're at war with terrorism, but the church is being used. Uh, so uh, it's not a, a particularly about liturgical renewal, but about the life of a liturgical church. How might I summarize uh, some of these brief presentations? Um, a, a lot of it's about supplementing existing prayer books more than it is about preparations for new prayer books, which is probably closer to the mark on your immediate concerns. Several categories uh, that just uh, I've already mentioned and I'll just summarize here. Where there are limited resources for liturgical developments, texts and follow-up take longer. And that means committees change and the trajectory can get lost. Where things need to be in multiple languages, everything gets a lot more complicated. Where there are first revisions and feedback, there is often not a process that allows comparison or a helpful sense, if you will, of the census fidelium. So what is intended to be broad-based consultation uh, doesn't always carry through. And of course, budget constraints often put liturgical commissions and liturgical renewal at the top of the expendable list. Um, Second, what came out of a lot of my conversations um, is theology. How are new rites presented? What is the catechesis? Does the committee or the committees understand the need to link these liturgical ritual changes to theology, to ritual, to culture, and above all, that they have some kind of systematic integrity? Uh, one thinks of the lack of theological introduction, prenotanda, which is so evident in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer of the United States. Rubrics are not the same as theology. How do we do theology in both poetry and prose? Third, culture. The profound differences in some of the cases above that I was just presenting to and the upcoming conversation for Canada. The differences between first world church issues of language updates, inclusivity, linguistic concerns, and people concerns, and many options that are not shared by all the member churches. Therefore, some of the ongoing work is very different. Some of these are financial, some are cultural, some are linguistic, some are theological, and even the ease of access to internet resources matters. Fourth, the multicultural reality, of course, related to the cultural context. Um, but what about the minority religious status that makes a difference, either ecumenically or interfaith, within their context? And the necessary focus, again, for member churches on issuing every revision in multiple languages, which means multiple culturally. 
And fifth, enculturation. The issue of enculturation versus globalization, articulated particularly in the Asian Anglican con uh, conversation, is complex. It's not this or that. There is enculturation from colonialism, but differences in how the faithful worshiping members actually understood themselves to be rooted in prayer shaped by that colonial colonialism was particularly evident in Hong Kong, where older Anglicans said, don't change the English language, even though it's my second language, because this is the identity of what it is to be Anglican in Hong Kong in a minority religion in this world. That's a type of enculturation. There is anti-enculturation uh, from a materialistic and consumerist culture. The Korean set, church said, we don't want to be enculturated into this. There is anti-enculturation based on the theology of time. In other words, it's not just a spatial enculturation, but also a temporal enculturation. The culture has no historical rooting. Tradition is important because it roots us not just spatially, but temporally through the centuries. Again, the Asian interest in the uh, Syriac Eucharistic prayer mm. with its deep links in China. There is a desire among um, uh, many member churches that I talked with to be global, to be part of a global church, which is a, a primary form of identification ritually and liturgically uh, against many of the free church traditions, Pentecostalist evangelistic groups um, in, in some of these places. And then there is globalization, <laughs> both against and for. The rising problem of identity versus this phenomenon. Uh, globalization is always also localization because most of us live in a local context which is shaped globally through first-hand experience as well as access to constant global information. So the same things are going on in places where there is internet access, where there is this access, so that local practice can be completely unanchored from actual place, culture, and people. I'm going to go design a liturgy, and I'm going to draw one thing from each continent, because I can. It's all online. So uh, the, the umbrella of enculturation can take many different forms.